Hi, my name is Arielle Nissenblatt. I am the founder of Earbuds Podcast Collective, the head of community and content at Squadcast.fm, and I'm the host of a podcast called Trailer Park, the podcast trailer podcast, and I'm a bestie. Hey, podcast besties. Welcome back to the show dedicated to making your podcast the best it can be. I'm Courtney Kosak, your BFF in helping you grow and monetize your show. And listen, besties, I get it. It's summer. I know we're all busy working and traveling and having fun. So that is why I have been taking my sweet time rolling out the rest of this season. But today's episode is so worth the wait. And I know you're going to agree with me because I have big podcasting's bestie and really all of our besties, Ariel Nissenblatt, on the show today. Ariel is the founder of Earbuds Podcast Collective and the head of community and content at Squadcast FM. You've probably seen her around Twitter. And in this episode, she's sharing podcast marketing examples from the launch of her new show, Trailer Park, the podcast trailer podcast, plus her recipe for a good podcast trailer, social media tips, how to co-market effectively, her advice for getting featured in the apps, and so much more. Okay, here we go. Okay, amazing. So excited to have this combo. So let's get your podcasting origin story. I feel like I knew you at the very beginning of yes. your podcasting origin story. We've known each other forever in podcast years. I know. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, my podcast origin story is that I really wanted to work in podcasting on the production side of things, but I had no idea how to go about doing that because <laughs> I did not have a background in it. And I wanted to find any way in possible. So it was like 2016. I just moved to Los Angeles. I was trying to intern anywhere that would take me, trying to apprentice anywhere that would take me, trying to just have coffee with anybody who would take me. And um, I was definitely having coffee with people. I was definitely applying to a lot of jobs, but I was not getting any jobs in editing or production or post-production or anything like that because I had no experience. And it turns out it's really hard to get experience when you don't already have experience. And I didn't have a background in journalism. But your strategy was good. The coffee, the coffee strategy. Yeah. I mean, look at you today. Don't you think yeah. that that's entirely the result of your coffee strategy? Total. It's a coffee strategy and it's the strategy of make up your own thing and make people have to talk to you. So all of this led to me saying okay, let me try to work on the business side, right? If I can't work on the production creative side, let me see what the business side is like. So I started Earbuds, the podcast recommendation newsletter, as a way to, number one, listen to more podcasts. Number two, have podcast lists curated for me and for other people. And number three, because it let me have a thing that people uh -huh. would need to talk to me about. Yeah. So newsletters, podcasts, any digital types of creation, they thrive when they are being collaborated with and you thrive when you are collaborating with others, right? So earbuds, the newsletter, later earbuds, the podcast that goes along with the newsletter are all things that allow me to reach out to people and say, hey, let's leverage these things and work together. So how long after you started earbuds were you able to like, because you worked at CastBox and then Squadcast, mm -hmm. how long until you wound up getting your dream, which was to work in podcasting? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I started Earbuds in February of 2017. And in November of 2017, I started managing a co-working spaces podcast studio in Los Angeles. I remember um, that. Yeah. Did, you go, did you ever go there? At one time, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty space. So they... Earlier that year, I pitched a bunch of different co-working spaces and was like, you should have podcast related things going on. And then this place was like, yeah, sure, come do it. And I was like, OK, let's see what that means. <laughs> so I did that for about a year and a half. And while I did that, I hosted networking events and kept getting coffee with people. And yes, I was working in the podcast space, but it wasn't fully in the podcast space. I was also doing work for the co-working space, like giving people tours and all that kind of stuff. And then just also managing the podcast studio bookings and things like that. So it wasn't quite the dream. It, it was wasn't like quite the dream. Close. It was close. Yeah, it was close. We were getting there. And then in 2019, well, what's interesting is my newsletter 
made people reach out to me, made people mm-hmm. say, hey, can I curate a list? Hey, can I advertise in your newsletter? Hey, can you do me a solid and put this piece of news in my newsletter? And over time, I, I started building relationships and strong relationships. And CastBox had advertised a few times in my newsletter. And then in 2018 at Podcast Movement in Philadelphia, I got to have a sit down meeting with the CEO of CastBox. And they were just asking for my feedback as a listener, you know, somebody who used the podcast listening app of CastBox. And because of that, they now knew my face and continued to pay for ads. And then about seven months later, they needed to fill a position and they thought of me. Amazing. So it all goes back to this newsletter. It all goes back to making a thing for myself, making people need to talk to me. (laughs) Yeah. So then I worked for them for about a year until August of 2020. And then I started working for Squadcast and I've been there ever since. Yay. (laughs) Okay. So, but your latest project is this Trailer Park podcast. So Mm -hmm. tell us about that. And then also what you've learned about the art of the podcast trailer while working on this. I love trailers. I really do. I love any teaser that gets people excited (laughs) about potentially finding a new thing to listen to. And there's a few origin stories for Trailer Park, the podcast trailer podcast. The first is that I love experimenting with different types of Twitter and LinkedIn engagement strategies. And one of the ones that I came up with was, here's a thread on Twitter of every day for the month of June of 2022. So this was last year. Let me listen to one of the trailers that is being currently posted on New and Noteworthy on Apple Podcasts. And then let me write a little bit about it. Was it effective? Was it entertaining? Am I going to listen to it? Am I going to go into listening to the rest of the show? So I did that for a month and I just found it to be a really interesting way to be exposed to new shows, some that I would never touch again, others that I definitely would touch again and maybe I wouldn't have if I hadn't set myself out to do this thing. And then I went on a road trip with my friend and she's been a podcast listener. She actually edits the Earbuds newsletter. Shout out to Abby. She's been doing it for six years and she's just the best editor in the land. She has been a podcast listener, but is definitely not a regular podcast listener because she doesn't have a commute and she's like gone in waves, but she's definitely an NPR girly. Like she mm-hmm. grew up listening to the radio. So she, she gets it. Good. Yeah. She, she understands <laughs> audio as entertainment. So we were in the car and we were listening to trailers. And what what I found is that we were listening to trailers for shows that I had already listened to and I was trying to turn her on to them. And what I found was that the trailers didn't often match the tone, texture, content, of the show they sort of get very very cinematic in a you know here's what's going to happen in this show and here's a clip and here's another clip and here's a clip from somebody with a different style voice get ready on june 19th (laughs) that's when the show drops and so i found that to be fascinating because i had only known that because i had then gone on to listen to the full shows or i had listened to the full shows already and when i was showing these to abby i'd be like that's not actually really what the show's about i do think you'd like it so that (laughs) got me really curious Oh, besties, this is so true. So I just want to take a second to underline this. When I teach my multi-week podcasting course, we always do some trailer listening together. And I have had exactly the same experience as Ariel, like every time. Typically, my students are unfamiliar with the podcast. And then after I play them the trailer, I ask if they know what the show is about based on the trailer. And even with the best of shows, like produced by the This American Life team, a lot of times the trailer is not a good representation of the show that it's trying to get people to listen to. And confusing potential listeners is not a great strategy for getting them to listen to your show. So anyway, this is such a helpful exercise for you to do with your trailer. Play it for a friend or a family member or a total stranger who is unfamiliar with your premise and ask them what they get from the trailer. Like, yes, you want to pique their interest. That's part of it. But also, maybe more importantly, you want them to be able to clearly articulate the premise and the value proposition of your show. Okay, back to Ariel. So then I started tweeting a different tactic, posting on LinkedIn as well. What if there was a show dedicated entirely to podcast trailers, whether those trailers exist and are part of larger bodies of work or were made for fun or were made as a joke or were made to potentially gain some funding but didn't actually Mm -hmm. gain that funding? 
And I kind of let that tweet sit there. And then I came back to it every few months when I had new developments with this project. So for example, when I found a co-host, Tim Viegas, or when I found out what my cover art would be, or what I found out what the music would sound like, the sonic identity of the show, who the guests would be, here's the submission form, here's the website. I was really building in public when it came to getting the show off the ground. Hey besties, I partnered with Mopod as the season one sponsor of this show and it has helped me reach so many new listeners, maybe even you. Podcast Bestie is almost to 50,000 downloads. That is five times my season one goal and Mopod has definitely given me a boost in that department. Mopod is an effective, targeted way to promote your show. It's already trusted by industry giants like Condé Nast, iHeartMedia, and the HubSpot Podcast Network, and that's because it works. But Mopod isn't just for the big guys. Mopod Boost is perfect for indie podcasters like me and you. And guess what? Mopod Boost is now even boostier because Mopod has supercharged its self-serve platform with AI-powered ad copy and and precision targeting. So that means it now has the ability to generate impactful ad copy using AI and the implementation of sophisticated targeting options such as geolocation, age, gender, and household income. And you can try it for just $100. Plus, if you're a bestie, you get 10% off with the link in the description. So try it out and let me know what you think. Okay, now back to Ariel, and we're going to get back to podcast trailers in a second. But first, I think we all need a social media lesson from the Twitter queen herself. Let's talk about trailers. But well, first, I want to talk about your Twitter and LinkedIn because you I see you do this a lot. And like, it's a whole different way of, you know, I have not been able to embrace those platforms for themselves, you know, for like, they're a little bit of an art to themselves and figuring out how to make them work. What's your strategy for those? And like, how do you test different things? And um, I'm not even smart enough about the platforms to ask it <laughs> <laughs> the proper question. Uh, it's a good question. I don't think I'm intentionally doing anything. I just, I go in with the thought of how can what I post be helpful for either Ariel, myself. I've never in my life been like, let me go back to that tweet from two months ago. Like, I'm not. Uh, interesting, interesting. <laughs> Do you I know see. what I mean? Even yes, that. Yes, yes. That's okay, like advanced. So you're talking about that. Um, yeah. Okay. So like, do you think of it as a content? Like, do you think of that? Con like, I'm just like, I'm, pro I'm here promoting my shit, which yeah. is promoting my shit and promoting the shit of the podcast industry. I think that's how I look at it is if there was a such thing as big podcasting, how can I be big podcasting's best friend? How can I be big podcasting's best? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I do think about myself. Sure. But I like to have a general rule that is not written anywhere and that I don't necessarily stick to every single day, every single month. But for everything that I post about myself, I try to post something positive to other people or about other people. Mm -hmm. And I think what that does is it forces me to get out of my own head. And it mm -hmm. also comes back to you. You know, it really does. If people see you as being helpful, they want to help you. Yes. Yeah. And are you planning your content there in advance? Or are you just, no. is it all off the cuff? Fly by the seat of my pants. Okay. But you are like, you do have your finger on the pulse. So you are seeing like different trends and stuff. And that's your strategy for like, how can I do my own riff on this and test engagement, right? Yes, I will definitely see a tweet or a LinkedIn post go viral in another sort of subset of creator communities. And I'll be like, how can I relate this to podcasting? Yes. Here's a meme format that's going viral. How does that relate to podcasting? And usually those things do pretty well. But another thing is like, the other day I tweeted something about, James Cridlin's pod.events, which is a, you can go to pod.events and if you have any events, whether they're in person or virtual, you can post that event and it'll be listed on his website so you get a nice backlink, but he also might even post it in his newsletter and that's great. You know, that's mm -hmm. free press for you. So the other day I posted about that, not because he had updated the page, not because it was in the zeitgeist in any way, but because I was like, you know what? I don't know if everybody knows about this and it is free mm -hmm. PR and people should know about that. So I'm not thinking once a week, like, hey, let me share a resource but it does end up shaking out to once a week, I share a resource. Once a week, I do an engagement <laughs> thread yeah, yes. where people are people get to show off something that they're working on. Once a week, I try to do like a funny tweet that relates to podcasting and pop culture. Once a week, I try to share a podcast recommendation. But I'm not thinking about anything. I'm not saying like, uh oh, I didn't post my podcast recommendation this week. <laughs> OK, yeah. 
Interesting. Okay, so from doing this trailer park show, what have you learned about what is a good trailer? What's the recipe? The first step is having one. So many people don't have trailers or don't think to prioritize it. And I think the reason you should have a trailer is because that trailer should drop a few weeks before your show drops. And the podcast bestie did this very well and work on getting people to the landing page, for lack of a better term, of your podcast in their favorite podcast listening app so that they can hit follow or subscribe so that when you do drop your first episode, people are followed or subscribed to it and they'll get a notification or they'll Mm -hmm. otherwise see it somewhere. So the first step is making something. What I did for Trailer Park is I made a pre-trailer, which was 34 seconds long. And I literally said, I was very transparent. I said, this is a placeholder. I am putting this here so that my feed can be alive. That's it. Here's a little bit of music. Here's a little taste of who I am. My name's Ariel. You can find out more about me and this podcast, Trailer Park, dot Trailer Park podcast, dot CRD, dot CO. You can go there. You had three teasers, yes, trailers, three didn't teasers. you? Very smart strategy. Lay it out for everybody. <laughs> yeah, I, I, li- I love being very transparent. So we had pre-trailer, then we had a trailer, and then we had what we called a teaser. So pre-trailer was 34 seconds. Trailer was about a minute and a half. And then the uh, teaser was three minutes. And so how did you decide about like timing those out and what they included? You were just including a little bit more information each time. Yeah. So the pre-trailer was really just, hey, this is coming soon. The trailer was, here's what you can expect in the show, and then when to expect it. And then the teaser was, meet me and Tim a little bit. Here's a little Uh bit more of our personalities. And here's what you can expect. And, you know, maybe we're going to give away a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So there's no real delineations between a teaser and a trailer. I think all my point was that I was playing around with the concept of, Let's give something away so that people are interested, but let's not give too much away that we are boring people because we're giving we're giving away our secrets or we're telling you everything that's happening in season one. Yeah. And you you sort of have to create your own moment. Right. Mm -hmm. And by having three trailers, you get to have have three moments. Three moments. (laughs) That was my strategy is make news every single time a new trailer drops or new episode drops. And it's hard. And I think about this a lot because if you have an ongoing season, your first few episodes are very exciting for you and for other people. People are pumped. You know, it's it's new. It looks new. The cover art is novel. You're not used to seeing it. But then by the fifth episode or so, you're like, okay, you know, it's hard week to week to churn this thing out. I know you're going through it right now. And I'm still working as hard as I was on the first episode, but it's kind of sad because it the novelty wears off for the people who are potentially listening and tuning in. Oh, yes. Um, I know. But another thing that I want to share with the besties and talk to you about, because I've seen you doing this and I've been trying to do this a lot too, is making a game out of the growth and or ratings and reviews. Like I have gotten so many more ratings and reviews for Private Parts Unknown since I started being like, every episode I'll be like, hey guys, we're trying to get to 75 on Spotify and we're trying to get to 250 on Apple Podcasts or whatever. And then I'll announce where we are and it's a game. People feel like they're in it. They feel like they're in it and they are honestly helping versus like just a blanket. Can you give me a rating and review? And one thing that I saw that was very smart with you is you had your three trailers out or whatever. And you were like, hey, you trying to get to a thousand or something like that. You're like sharing your download goals yeah. and you're making your listeners feel like they're part of helping you reach that, which they are. It works for this show. It works for Trailer Park. It works for Podcast Bestie because it's a podcast about podcasts. Yeah. It doesn't work for every type of show. Not every show needs all that transparency. But if you have a podcast that's for creators, I think be transparent about what you're doing and is it working? And even periodically on other shows, like The Bleeders, when I make a moment out of it and be like, hey, I'm trying to, now I try to make a goal each time with with my people. I think it works because it's for creators. I think people are invested in what it takes to have your own thing and make that thing thrive. Yeah. Hey besties, just a quick break for a word from our sponsors and I am so excited to tell you about Memento. Listen, being successful with podcasts and video is a full-time job that most people don't have the time or experience to do, right? It's a lot, but Momento makes it easy because Momento is an end-to-end AI video marketing tool that finds your most shareable moments and creates beautiful shorts and even schedules straight to social. Can it do more? Yes. Momento can write 
high quality show notes, social posts, tweets, and even jokes from your content. It seriously can do everything. I have been using it for all of my social clips and even YouTube shorts, and it has quickly become my new favorite. And you can try it too. Your first upload is free, so go see what AI can do with your video. Give Memento a try with the link in the description. And also check out the links in the episode description to sign up for the Tilt and Morning Brew newsletters. The Tilt is a newsletter for professional content creators and Morning Brew will help you become smarter in just five minutes. You need both in your inbox. And if you want to reach the Podcast Bestie audience, you can buy a sponsorship to Podcast Bestie at podcastbestie.com slash advertise. Okay, now back to the show. Okay, so you're a podcast marketer. What was your strategy going into launching this new show? How did you set yourself up for success? If I had to boil it down to a sentence, I would say everything, everywhere, all at once. (laughs) I (laughs) try to pop up in as many newsletters, podcast listening apps, other editorial places, on other podcasts, in around the same time to as much as I can control that. Some of those things are still rolling in, even though we Mm -hmm. finished season one. Right now we're between seasons. Right now this interview is happening and it's going to hopefully drive some more people to check out Trailer Park, but we're between seasons. But those episodes are still very valuable. But around February of 2023, just a few months ago, when we dropped the real first episode of Trailer Park, we really tried to make sure that we were being featured in Pod News. We were being featured in Podcast Bestie. We were being featured in Earbuds. We were be- being featured in the Lauren, Lauren Passell suite of newsletters. <laughs> we were being featured in uh, Katie Lore's newsletter. We were being featured in Podstack. We were be- Everywhere right. you can imagine, I tried to get at least a mention yes. so that you couldn't possibly not see me. So that you see me so much that you're like, you know what? Maybe this show sucks, but I at least have to try it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. Did you do any anything paid or it was all organic? I did a Mopod boost just like you did. Nice. To uh, on one of our episodes, but we did it as a we did it as a partnership to I would then come to them and say what worked well. And we talked a little bit about it on the show. And we're going to do a bonus episode, I believe, sometime down the line about that. Nice. I do want to recommend too to besties syncing up if you do something paid, you know, you were just mentioning trying to get all of your coverage in this condensed period of time. And same thing goes for your paid too. Like you yeah. want to sync that up with your release date. You want to sync that up with as much other press as you have so that, you know, if you're like trying to climb the charts or something, you can make the most out of that. And so that you can track it. So I think. Maybe what you try to do is go organic at first and then maybe towards the middle of your season when there's that mid-season slump, that's when you do some paid so that you can easily attribute that to paid rather than, oh, is this because of my editorial pitchings? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though, yeah, it depends what your goal is. Um, And it's nice to do it a few episodes in, too, because you have multiple episodes that people can listen to when they find your show, which is Mm -hmm. good. So one thing that I hear you talk about a lot is co-marketing. And I would love to have you explain what co-marketing is and some good examples and how people, indie podcasters especially, can set up successful co-marketing campaigns. Yeah. Co-marketing is a thing that I have been doing without having a term for it for a really long time. But the term came to me when I was listening to an episode of the Sounds Profitable podcast Uh, I want to say a year ago, maybe a little bit more, Brian Barletta was speaking to Steve Wilson, who is now at Q Code, but he used to work at Apple for a long time. And he was talking about how one of his strategies at Q Code in order to launch shows is to create co-marketing campaigns with Apple. Apple wants people to listen on Apple. Spotify wants people to listen on Spotify. CastBox wants people to listen on CastBox. I could go on all day. Why? They need daily active users. They need monthly active users in order to prove to their shareholders that this is a worthwhile app or to, you know, if they are an ad space platform to have ad impressions, things like that. So in order to make people want to listen on these apps, they need to make sure that their home pages are enticing. And in order for that to be the case, they shouldn't look like every single other home page. Yes, of course, you're going to have some of the categories are top charts, top podcasts in this area, but others are going to be editorially curated. And how do they find out about these editorial 
podcasts that they could potentially feature, they need to be pitched. Some of the podcast listening apps have forms where you can apply to be featured. Some you just got to be stealthy and find some email addresses and find some DMs and open up those DMs and hope for the best. Make a nice relationship and (laughs) don't pitch right away. You know, don't shoot your shot too early. But making sure that you are co-marketing with these people. So a phrase that I really like is, Hi, person at Pocket Cast. I would really love to find a way to promote Pocket Cast and then for you to promote my show. Why? Because I really love Pocket Cast. I listen on Pocket Cast. I want more people to listen on Pocket Cast. And I already know that you have featured shows like mine in the past. So I'm curious if you'd consider featuring mine at this time. And what that does is it allows you to have a nice placement if you're accepted on their homepage, and then you can milk that for all it's worth. You can take a screenshot, you can talk about it, you can post it in your newsletter that you were featured. And then just, um, you know, the rule of thumb here is you don't want to be cheating on every platform. So you don't want to like go to Spotify at the same time that you go to Apple at the same time that you go to Spotify, CastBox, Stitcher. So choose one, make an ask. If they say yes, awesome. Be loyal to them. If they say no or they don't answer you, try something else. And then, of course, you're going to see some podcasts that are featured on all of them all the time, all at once. And that's good for them. But it's not always going to happen. How can indie podcasters do this? Just the way that I did. I'm an indie podcaster. I did this. It took me a while to build up these relationships, but it's not because I'm special. It's because I took the time. I think Good Pods is a really great option. And another thing to consider is not all of these podcast listening apps being featured is not going to necessarily guarantee thousands and thousands of downloads, but it's Mm -hmm. all part of building buzz around your show. So getting featured on Good Pods, even though it might not drive so many new listeners to you, it's still great for you to be able to say, check us out. We were featured on Good Pods. And then you might even chart in Good Pods charts. And then Uh you can post that you were charting in Good Pods charts. All of these things are things that you can point back to and that you can eventually take screenshots of and put in your deck for your next season. Yeah. Totally. So I I was just talking to Lauren about this, but I sometimes feel like with those submissions, I'll submit and I don't hear back and I feel like it's just going into the void. So then I just will get discouraged and I won't want to do it for, it'll be like a year later and then I'll be like, shit, I should do that again. (laughs) So how do you create a successful, like how do you pitch them something that It's going to be enticing if you're not like the biggest show. Find out who they are. Find out who are the people who are making these curations. So I'm not like going to out any of these people because that's not the game I'm playing. But they make themselves pretty obvious about who they are. Like if you go on LinkedIn and you search Apple in the search bar and you might have to do some sifting, but you can find out who puts in their bio that they work for Apple. And then they might even put in their bio that they work for editorial within Apple. But A lot of those people, I'm not saying DM them, but I am saying that every once in a while they'll tweet, hey, I am looking to curate a list on X, Y, and Z. What podcast do you know? Here's our form. Uh Recently, somebody posted that there's a new spotlight form. You can now apply to have people spotlit on Apple Podcasts. And look, again, just because you apply does not mean you are entitled to being featured. But how do you up your chances? I think the question to ask yourself is why should this be featured now? That's actually a question that Apple asks themselves. Spotify doesn't ask that exact question on their form, but they have some questions that I think just making sure you are being very clear as to why your podcast should be featured, why now, who is in this episode, why is it special, why is it different, and what are listeners going to take away from this episode? What does it fit into? Make it clear that you are aware of other shows that they have featured in the past and how your show not only fits into that, but also breaks the mold a little bit. Yeah, I understand being discouraged. I have applied hundreds of shows and only gotten a few approved as being featured. But you know what? That's not a terrible, that's not a terrible percentage. And also I can't expect them to just like see my name and be like, oh, got to trust Ariel implicitly. (laughs) They, they're running a ship, you know, they, they have to make sure that these shows are high quality They have to make sure that they are adding something to the discussion and that they're not playing any favors too. So how often should you be pitching? Should you be pitching them? I don't think that there is a set amount of times that you should or shouldn't be pitching. I think when you have something that you feel is buzzy, great. And it could be that you feel that every single episode is buzzy. Uh, I would encourage you to look at that. Think again. (laughs) (laughs) You know when you've got something great on your hands, you know. What's the most that you would do? Like every other month? I I would go every month. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it depends. Like I am often pitching on behalf of people who have shows launching. 
But for my own show, I actually don't pitch my own show that often because I'm kind of like the Apple people know who I am. If they want to uh-huh. feature me, they can feature me. <laughs> right. And you know what? If they do, great. If they don't, I'm going to wait my turn, basically. Is if it happens, it happens. I actually have been featured on New and Noteworthy with one of my podcasts, Counter Programming, and it was huge. Yes. But it brought good and bad. It brought us to 18,000 downloads for the month of July that we were featured as opposed to regularly we were getting like between 2,000 and 4,000 downloads. So it was huge. But it also brought us from a five-star rating to a 3.6 because yeah. it exposes you to people who might not like you. Totally. So I'm not saying that you should not seek feature just because of that. But I am saying there are some things that you should be aware of. That's exactly what happened with Reality Bites when we got really? a home page feature. Yeah, just people were mean about our voices and stuff. Fuck but, that. <laughs> but that's what happens when you're yeah. reaching way more people, which I'll take it. Um, (laughs) so, okay. You see a lot of collabs. You see a lot of swaps. You see a lot of cross promos. Give me a cool out of the box example of how indie podcasters could collaborate and market their shows. Yes. I will give an example that Tim and I did for trailer park. So we set up a lot of interesting paid promos as well as non-paid promos. So we had a bunch of sponsors for season one. And one of the things that we did in order to make sponsorship with one of our sponsors, which was the Vocaster from Focus, right, more enticing to this sponsor was we not only did a giveaway on every single episode where if you filled out a form, you could win a vocaster from Focus, right? So we gave away eight, one for each episode of season one. But we are also going to be interviewing Dan Hughley of Focus, right? And we're going to be putting that episode out. And hopefully that episode doesn't read a spawn con, but is actually just exciting. Here's why you might consider using an audio interface. So that's mm-hmm. something that it's not a paid episode, but it is part of our larger offering for a paid sponsorship. So that's on the paid side. But I do want besties to take away the idea that like you have more to offer than you think you do. Even if you're only getting 100 downloads per episode, you can offer this bespoke episode. You can interview a potential sponsor and say, this is part of the package when you sign on with us for season one. A nice branded episode is super valuable to someone. If they know that it's going to sound good and you can make them a piece of content, that is extremely valuable. They can send it to whoever they want. Yeah. It doesn't matter who your audience is. Look how good we sound. Look how good I made us look. Another thing that we did with Trailer Park, the podcast Trailer Podcast, that is uh, (laughs) non-paid, is one of our episodes we featured the trailer for a podcast called Serum from WHYY and Local Transmedia. And we liked it so much that we liked the trailer so much. And Tim, my co-host, went on to listen to the entire series. And a lot of people actually told me, wow, I loved this so much. I actually like went right from listening to this trailer to listening to the entire series. Three people have told me that, which is great. Cool. Tim reached out to Grant Hill, who was the reporter on that show, and asked to interview him. And we're going to be dropping that interview in our feed. And you can bet that Grant is going to be very proud of that and we'll be posting about it on social. So that's just a collaboration that we wanted to do out of the goodness. I'm not going to say the goodness of our hearts out of the fact that we just love this, that we, yeah. that we thought it was great. And that's not something that we plan for, but it is something that can come up and that you should feel free to explore because people um, are definitely interested in talking about their creative processes and you can take advantage of that. Yes. So, okay, you talked a little bit about paid advertising, but what would you say if besties have a limited budget and they were going to prioritize just a couple paid things, what are your top recs for things that they should look into? Yeah, I like Mopod. I like Amaze Media Labs has a semi-similar product to Mopod uh, that I would check out or that I have been doing some experimenting with. I like buying ads on CastBox. I like buying ads on Overcast and Pocket Cast. However, those are impression-based as opposed to guaranteed. So that's just something to be aware of. It mm-hmm. is not something I recommend if you have a limited budget and it's the only thing you're considering. But if you have a limited budget, depending how limited it is, and you're trying to spread that out a little bit, I would consider that. I do also like the idea of advertising in newsletters, but most likely not newsletters that are podcast 
industry focused, more so newsletters in your general topic area. I recently did a swap earbuds. My newsletter did a swap with a newsletter called The Future Party, and they brought us 113 clicks and a good percentage of those people converted. I think it was like 25% conversion. And that was ju- that was a free swap. So I posted in my newsletter about them. Mm-hmm. They posted in mine. But this is all to say the newsletters do work and it just needs to be the right target. It needs to be the right copy. So if you have money, I like spending there, but I would also consider that you might not get the copy right the first time around. So definitely make sure that it is reading right, that your call to action is the right one, that your landing page is optimized for people to press play or to subscribe to your newsletter, whatever it is you're asking them to do. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is fun. Um, (laughs) I am asking everyone. I'm auditing you. You're auditing me. You already know what's coming. Yes. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Hit me. You You already know my, my offerings. How should I audit you? Hmm. I wish I prepared this. I just knew that you were going to ask and then I didn't think to to actually say anything. This is so niche, but I <laughs> would play around with the different colors that you have going on with the podcast bestie stuff in your social images. Right now, every time you post an episode, you post um, the person on a blue background. I would yes. play around with the pink. And the reason for that is because I think people's eyes get tired. And we were talking a little bit about fatigue when it comes to the middle of the season. And now that you are going to be a few episodes in, I think as much as you can shock people. So sometimes that means with social media images. Sometimes that means with the copy that you use in order to tell people to subscribe and to leave us a rating and review. But I think in every episode of your show, but also in general, people should be asking their their listeners to do an action. And maybe you want to ask the same thing every week, but make sure you're changing up the wording. Make sure you're changing up the colors. Make sure you're changing up. This goes for everything. You can ask the same thing, but make sure you kind of shock people so that they never feel like they can skip it over. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Anything else you want to share with the besties before we wrap? You've already shared so much helpful information. You better listen to that trailer park show, but you better. anything else? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that we are trying to grow the podcast space, both creators and listeners. So whether you're a creator or a listener, tell somebody new about podcasts. There's uh, an initiative right now going on through Lauren Passell's Tink Media called Adopt a Listener Month. And I don't know when this episode is dropping, but we're recording in April. April is Adopt a Listener Month. So if you go to tinkmedia.co slash adopt, you'll learn a lot about how to adopt a listener and how to just grow the pie. Because I think the more people that listen to podcasts, the more likely we are to be able to help people, help creators get paid to continue doing this. And hopefully people can do this for a living. It's so much fun. Yeah. Love it. That's the dream. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again to Ariel. Oh, that was such a good conversation. And just a little note that season one interviews were recorded this spring, but Adopt a Listener Month is really every month, right? So we should always be trying to spread the word to new potential podcast listeners. And thank you for tuning into Podcast Vesti Vesti. Make sure you check out the last episode with Jeff Umbro of The Podglomerate if you're hungry for more podcast marketing inspiration. And Podcast Vesti is now now on YouTube. So head over to youtube.com slash at podcast bestie to subscribe. You can watch my interviews with Ariel, Jeff Umbro, James Cridland, and Gary Arndt. Podcast Bestie has been getting some awesome new reviews from the podcasting community on Apple Podcasts. So I just want to shout them out right now. I got one from a writer 06 packed with useful tips. I was just turned on to this show and listened to the most recent episode, which had a ton of information about ad buys and other audience growth strategies. I'm streaming another one now and look forward to catching up with the feed. So a writer 06, I don't know if you have a show, but if you do hit me up and let me know about the show so I can shout that out in a future episode. And I got another review from Thorn132, packed with great info. Thank you so much for this pod. As a newbie podcaster, I feel like there is so much to know and it's hard to know where to begin or who to listen to. This show curates the best in the business and I've learned a ton so far. Looking forward to being besties for a long time. Ah, me too. That is from Maria, the co-host of the Pure Cringe podcast. 
And Pure Cringe is a comedy podcast. Here's a little bit about the show. We are Maria and Michelle, two old friends, book lovers, and Bravo TV super fans. Join the fun as we review Bravo Liberty books and recap classic Bravo TV episodes. That sounds like a fun show. And I got one more review from Looters Podcast. Thoughtful and fun. Podcast Bestie is full of useful tips about how to survive in the great wilderness of podcasting. I've really enjoyed all of the guests so far, and Courtney does a wonderful job gently pushing her interviewees to give specific advice with examples so we can all learn and take action. The Podcast Bestie Substack is also a great resource, and I love the partnership with Michael Castaneda, who gives great audio engineering tips. Oh, I love that. I love the shout out for Mike. Mike is my ride or die audio guy. He is the one that makes me sound amazing on these episodes, and he does all my shows with me. We have worked together professionally a bunch too. And Mike does a column for the Podcast Bestie Substack, and he is giving the best tips on editing, mixing, engineering. So you definitely need to check that out. And right now he is offering paid besties a mentorship. This is such a high value offer. It's kind of incredible that he's doing this and it's only available for paid besties. So I think that's a great reason to subscribe. You can even do it at the $5 a month monthly level and just do the mentorship. So if you needed a little nudge, there you go. And let me tell you a little bit about the Looters podcast. So Looters is an actual play. It's sci-fi Western tabletop RPG using the Stars Without Numbers gaming system. And it's actually done by a bunch of improv actors. And I think that is such a good outlet during the strike. So check out the Looters comedy podcast. And I'm putting the links to both of these shows in the show notes. So make sure to check out the Pure Cringe podcast and the Looters podcast. And I want to collaborate with you, Bestie. If you leave me a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and you email it to me, I'm going to give you a free shout out on the show right here next episode. Plus, there is another super easy way to get featured on the show. You can buy a sponsorship at podcastbestie.com slash advertise. I have super affordable packages starting at just $30. And check out my other podcasts for more of my audio creations. I have Private Parts Unknown, which is about love and sexuality around the world, and The Bleeders, about book writing and publishing. And you can follow me in between episodes at Courtney Kosak. That is K-O-C-A-K on Instagram and Twitter. And I send out lots of newsletter exclusives to my besties. Podcast Bestie actually started as a newsletter, and you can subscribe for free. So make sure you're signed up for Podcast Bestie on Substack. That is podcastbestie.substack.com slash welcome. Until next time, happy podcasting. Bye, bestie. <laughs>